From Tech TV, welcome to Panorama. I'm your hostess, Gada Hamadani. While in the past few years, protests in Iraq have become common, but this time, Iraqis are not calling for a fall down of a leader or a political party. It's a revolution calling for the end of a political system which has existed since the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. A system which they argue has failed them. What's the impact of this revolution which has synchronized with another two movements in Iran and Lebanon on the occupation forces in the region? My guest today was born and raised in Basra, Iraq. Earned his doctorate degree in political science from Gotha University in Germany and teaches Middle East politics at York University in Toronto. He has published diverse articles and books in the subject in Arabic, English, and German languages. I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Sabah al Nasseri. Good to be with you, Rada. Thank you. Um, Allow me first to make a small comment regarding the intro. Absolutely. It's not like um, the young people in Iraq um, want the fall of the political system. They are actually demanding a parliamentary democratic system, a regime. Mm -hmm. What they are you know, trying to achieve or change is the way how this system was institutionalized. Mm -hmm. It was institutionalized on the basis of a sectarian ethno quote, which actually destroyed the democratic character of the system. Mm -hmm. So what people are asking are radical reform, radical democratic reform, to regain the system in a way that it becomes democratic, representative, and satisfy the demand of the people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Sabah, up until 2003, Iraq was both geographical and political barrier, actually vast barrier between Iran and their alliance in the West, mm -hmm. Syria and Lebanon. Right. But by removing Saddam Hussein regime, the United States removed that barrier. And in fact, you know, it's like Iran always had ambitions. Mm -hmm to expand in the region. Mm -hmm. So how do you read that? Right. Uh, the United States did two mistakes mm -hmm. bef you know, before and after the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. The first one was when they invaded Iraq and mm -hmm. destroyed the state and state institution, mm -hmm. the security apparatus of the state, the bureaucracy and so on, they did not build something instead. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a plan. So they were going from day to day. Mm -hmm. which created an enormous vacuum in Iraq mm -hmm. that enabled, you know, neighboring countries to expand their influence within Iraq, and especially mm -hmm. Iran. That's the first mistake. The second mistake was the Bush administration at that time, they relied on these so-called Shiite and Kurdish political parties as a mean because they know that they were supported by Iran. Mm -hmm. So to them, it was an instrument, a bridge, mm -hmm. uh, through which or over which they can have some sort of communication, negotiation, whatever, with Iran indirectly. Mm -hmm. So it was in their, what they thought, it was in their own interest mm -hmm. to have such political parties governing in Iraq that has, you know, deep connection to Iran mm -hmm. in a way it enabled the U.S. to influence indirectly on the politics in Iran. Mm -hmm. But then, after a while, they realized that was a mistake mm -hmm. because this political vacuum and with these, especially the Shiite political parties, allies of the, of, of the uh, regime in Iran, and they have their allegiances to the Wilayat uh, al-Faqih mm -hmm. uh, in Iran, the political system in Iran, enabled Iran to expand beyond Iraq to Syria and Lebanon on the one hand. Or on the other hand, because of these mistakes, it created, these mistakes created instabilities in the Gulf region, in the Arab Gulf region. Mm -hmm. So these two mistakes actually were the major causes of the corruption within the political regimes, 
the sectarian politics, the, the f f uh, division among the Iraqi people, um, creating a, what they so-called muhasasa, an mm -hmm. ethno-sectarian power-sharing formula, sh power sharing formula, which just destroyed the actually the, the, the instabilities and, and, um, of Iraq and uh, enabled even more mm -hmm. the influence of Iran to take hold of Iraqi politics and so on beyond Iraq to Syria and Lebanon. So in your opinion that the United States made a big mistake exactly. by choosing the... Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And I think only in the last few years, mm -hmm. and, in, and remember in 2014, uh, ISIS occupied almost one third of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And the United States realized that these political parties and the enormous support the United States gave to these parties at the security, military, economic, whatever level, went in vain. Actually, it went in corruption. Mm -hmm. And you saw this in 2014 when ISIS invaded um, uh, Al-Ambar and then Mosul and so on, it occupied huge cities with millions of, of people within a few days without any resistance from the Iraqi army because mm -hmm. there was no army. Yeah. There were only militias with their allegiances to the parties of Iran. Mm -hmm. So they did not defend Iraq. That, again, enabled Iran, actually, to expand its influence within Iraq because now the border are open and under the cover of fighting ISIS, they brought their militias and so on, crossed the border in Iraq and Syria and controlled the corridor between Syria and Iraq up to Iran. Mm -hmm. So again, that was in the, the consequences of the mistake of the United States. And I think ever since the United States um, realized that they need to change their course, they need to bet on other political forces in, in Iraq. That's why they let down al-Maliki at that time in 2014 and supported mm -hmm. Abadi to become minister president, thinking that he's more, you know, <coughs> West-leaning kind of politician. Partly they were right, but not, but only partly, because on the other hand, he was supported by Iran too. He is from the same al dawa party, the political party of al-Maliki and al-Jafari and all these minister presidents that governed Iraq since 2004 until today. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, evaluate and analyze the relationship between Iran and the United States? Mm -hmm. Actually, I would say before 2000 and before and after 2003, yeah. but now actually we have a huge incidence, which is Soleimani's right. uh, killing. Right. So how do you evaluate it? You know, it's like we have two different major right. events. Right. I would say, I mean, until... October 2019. Mm -hmm. First of October, we have a revolution in Iraq. I call it a revolution because mm -hmm. it's a radical reform of the social, economic, and, and political and institutional setting within Iraq. Mm -hmm. It's not just political demands or yeah. uh, economic demands. So until then, the United States um, relatively was, you know, satisfied with the way things worked out with Iran that both, both the United States and Iran have some, some influence within Iraq through their allies and so on within Iraq. But the, the revolution in Iraq, the October Revolution, I call it in Iraq, since uh, um, October 1st, 2019, took everyone by surprise. Mm -hmm. And here we see that Iran was threatened more by this revolution than the United States because you can see the anti-Iranian character of this revolution. And Iran felt threatened that this revolution could spill over across the border to Iran and start destabilizing the Iranian regime. And Iran has already an economic crisis due to the sanctions, but not only the sanctions, it's a long, you know, failed economic policies and corruption, etc. So Iran already facing a major economic crisis. Now, if you have a political crisis at the same time, or a crisis of legitimacy, if people went on the street, which they did on November mm -hmm. 20th, and start demanding their right, just like in Iraq, it is the biggest threat to Iran, not the United States, and not the US military bases in Iraq. That's just for political performance, you know, ideological notion that they are against the US and military bases, but de facto, they fear the October Revolution. So the US realized now through the October Revolution, since it has an, an anti-Iranian character, and young people in Iraq insist on their independence and sovereignties, the U.S. was much more sympathized, 
with this revolution, and whereas Iran saw in it a major threat. That's why Iran tried, I would say through three steps, tried to put down this revolution through its political par allies, political parties, and militias in Iraq. First, they tried to use snipers and killers and kidnappers to scare and intimidate young Iraqi activists. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. The second thing, and especially Qasem Soleimani, was insisting on, after the resignation of Adil Abdel Mahdi, the minister president, to name a minister president from within the Shiite bloc that allies with Iran to control the transitional period. And his objective, I think, was as such that if he was able to impose a candidate for the, for the prime minister in Iraq, he would speculate that this transitional period would go beyond six or nine months, probably for one year. Mm -hmm. And then, until then, we will have election in the United States in November 2020. Mm -hmm. And they were speculating that Trump might lose the election and the Democrat win the election and the Democrats are more willing to negotiate with Iran and thus lift the sanction. That was the, the plan of Soleimani. And, but the Iraqi president was under pressure from the U.S. not to accept the candidate of the Khalif al Bina, which is the Shiite coalition in, within the parliament. And he said he's willing to resign, but he will not accept this candidate. He wants a candidate from the street. So then they moved to the third steps, and I think that was to provoke the U.S. into some sort of a military confrontation and through that to try to put down the revolution in Iraq. So they start using their militias in Iraq to, you know, attack some military bases in, in the United States, thinking probably that the U.S. might, be, might feel provoked and react to it. And then that's what they wanted, actually. But I think the U.S., and I would say most likely the Pentagon, mm -hmm. um, they were smart in their move. They reacted in a way just to send a message. They did not you know, engage in a military confrontation. But after the attack on the U.S. embassy in the Green Zone by these mm -hmm. militias allies with, the, with Iran, of course, the, U the U.S. felt provoked. Now, there's a coincidence, you might want to call it the coincidence, mm -hmm between the, let's say, let's put it this way, between the intention of the United States to get rid of Soleimani and some political forces within Iran, Iraq, and Syria actually also to get rid, get rid of Soleimani because he became too powerful. He crossed many red lines mm -hmm. and they felt threatened by him because he was directly supported by Khamenei, mm -hmm. and he has enormous resources and funding and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and militias that he controls, and he has mm -hmm. an enormous space of maneuver that no one can control. So they feared he might represent a threat. Now, so I think there was a coincidence here between the intention of the U.S. and these political forces, and even some you know, military forces in these three countries to get rid of Soleimani. Okay. Uh, do you see a major geopolitical changes in the region soon? If the October Revolution in Iraq, mm -hmm. if it is successful, and I bet it will be successful, mm -hmm. because I observed right from the beginning that this corrupt political regime, represented by mostly these Shiite political parties and their militias, they tried everything they can mm -hmm. to put down these you know, protests in all major cities and provinces in Iraq. They couldn't. Mm -hmm. So I expect that things will change. If things change in a positive way, if the uh, protesters manage to nominate their own candid candidate for the minister presidency and his cabinet, and control the transitional period in a way that a much more democratic, transparent election take place and more representative government come out of these elections, then I think Iraq would be much more sovereign in its decision making and Iran influence will be significant, significantly reduced in Iraq, mm -hmm. which would put Iran under enormous pressure. Because, you see, Iraq is not just 
a security or military space for Iran. I call it a strategic depth for Iran. Mm -hmm. Because without Iraq, Iran cannot survive the economic crisis and the sanction that the U.S. imposed on them. So through Iraq, they not only, you know, uh, um, exchange, you know, weapons and militias and so on, but, you know, a huge trade up to $20 billion a year, mm -hmm. which is one way from Iran to Iraq. Money laundering, a huge amount of the dollars, right, especially from yeah. the Iraq Central Bank goes through these fake money marts and, and the banks and goes to Iran. So it, 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 Iran needs Iraq to survive and sideline these sanctions. And I think the U.S. knows this. Mm -hmm. And that's why they are, they are so symp sympathetic to the revolution, because they want Iraq to be more mm -hmm. independent from Iran. This will put really Iran under pressure that the Iranian regime might be willing to negotiate with the Trump administration on the Trump administration terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the intention of the Trump administration. Okay, is it a coincidence that <coughs> we have revolutions in Iraq, in Iraq Iran, Lebanon mm -hmm. uh, at the same time? Yes. And who's behind these revolutions? Right. One thing for sure I can tell you, Mm -hmm. There's no one behind them. Because if there was one, anyone behind them, the U.S. or Europe or the Gulf, they would have mm -hmm. been successful long ago. Um, you see, I call it a revolution because it's a process of radical reforms. And it has many causes and, 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 and mm -hmm. contexts and so on. But like any revolution, it needed, just like the Arab Spring in Tunisia and Egypt, it needed some sparks. Mm -hmm. And we had a few sparks in September in Iraq. I don't want to go on. But there were sparks that mm -hmm. brought these young people men and women, to the street, cross provinces in Iraq, and start protesting and, and demanding their rights. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, their demands were within the, you can say, the rule of the game, right? But once, and especially from the first day, the government of Abdel Abdel Mahdi, with the help of these pro-Iran militias, start using snipers and killers mm -hmm. uh, against the protesters, they became radicalized. Mm -hmm. And now they did not demand some reform or services anymore. No, they said they want now a radical restructuring uh, of the whole system. Mm -hmm. So it was the mistake of the government and, and the militias and how they reacted to these young people's demands that radicalized them. And as they go, people from all walk of life in Iraq realize Mm -hmm. that their demands are right and that the way the government's reacting to them is wrong. So the religious institution, Al-Sistani, Al-Hawza, and, and, and Najaf, and Karbala, mm -hmm. sided with them. The majority of the Iraqi tribes and their leaders sided with them. Mm -hmm. Young and old people sided with them, start supporting them logistically and um, morally and socially. So it gained a dynamic that even the young activists who went, who went in the street in the first day, they were not expecting this. Mm -hmm. It was beyond their expectation. And so mm -hmm. it's, the revolution went on and on, and not only on and on, but started expanding. Last week, the protest that gave the government the last uh, chance, a one-week uh, chance to uh, you know, satisfy the demand of the protesters, but the government didn't do anything, quite the opposite. Start again reacting with violence. So since yesterday, we can see there's an escalation of the, of the protest in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And um, they start blocking the streets, major streets, the highways, and so on. So um, I expect that in the next few days, um, things will become more intense. This coincided with another event, which is of Muqtad al-Sadr and the Sadr's mm -hmm. movement to call for a, <coughs> a march on January 24th, this coming Friday, against the presence of the so-called foreign troops, but the, what they mean is the U.S. Is he trying to hijack the revolution? Two things. Mm -hmm. One, yes. Mm -hmm. Try to hijack the revolution and gain some sort of political capital out mm -hmm. of this situation for himself and for his movement, yeah. for, let's say, coming election and whatever. The second thing, I think, the Equally important, after the death of Qasim Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, mm -hmm. a major figure, uh, a leader of these um, uh, pro-Iran militias, 
these pro-Iran militia, pro -Iran militias were weakened. Mm -hmm. And especially because the, the leaders of these militias participated in the attack on the U.S. embassy. So they know they are threatened now by the U.S. Mm -hmm. So Iran realized these militias were weakened. So they start betting on al-Sadr now. That's why it was not a coincidence that the Southern called for this march on January 24th from Qum in Iran. And there he met with Mahdi al-Amri, uh, uh, al-Amri, yes, mm -hmm. the, the head of the Ta'alif al-Bina in the parliament, so that they can decide who is the next prime minister in Iraq for the transition mm -hmm. period, someone who will be close to Iran. So now he's trying to use this situation too to tell Iran, I am the person who can sustain Iran influence in Iraq and you have to go along with what I want and what I decide. So he's trying to use both you know, ends mm -hmm. to his own benefits. But the protesters in Iraq realize this mm -hmm. and start pushing back against it and that they are aware that such a march on uh, January 24th, uh, you know, the objective of it is precisely mm -hmm. to not only sideline but try to put down the real revolution in Iraq, and bring something what I call a passive revolution. That means changes from the top through al-Sadr and al-Amiri and their government, right? Mm -hmm. Introduce few reforms and then tell the people to go back home. But that will not work, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see a role for Turkey soon in the region? And why they are, it's like we don't hear anything from them right now. Right, I mean, Turkey is not really, um, a party in this revolution, mm -hmm. but Put Turkey is already in Iraq, mm -hmm. in northern Iraq and Kurdistan Iraq, and especially near Mosul, mm -hmm. where the Turkmenian, Turkmenian community lives. So they have a military base there. Of course, they say they use it to fight PKK, but of course they want to influence also mm -hmm. politics in Iraq. But they are not really a, a party in this um, equation between Iran and the U.S. and the the, the revolution in Iraq. Much more. They are much more involved or a party in Syria, mm -hmm. not only militarily and in and, 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 and a security sense, but also mm -hmm. in, uh, in a political and some even um, let's say geostrategic sense. Mm -hmm. Their influence there is you know, much more present and obvious than in Iraq. So Turkey is not really a, a party. The, the Gulf region, because of their, they have all their own crisis in a way, mm -hmm. um, the, even the, they sympathize. With the, with the October Revolution in Iraq, because it's pushed back against Iran, because they saw in Iran since 1979 a threat because of sectarian character. Mm -hmm. And since they have Shiite community, and almost all of them, all the Gulf countries, they felt threatened from within mm -hmm. that Iran could, you know, mobilize the Shiite community against these regimes, right, and represent mm -hmm. a threat to them. So they felt threatened to them. Now they see in the October Revolution as mm -hmm. a w an exit option, a way out of the sectarian um, um, politics, because the, as I said before, you know, the this, the anti-Iranian character of this of this revolution in Iraq, and the insistence of these young people on an independent, sovereign, democratic Iraq, would benefit the whole Gulf region, because a strong, independent Iraq was always historically you know, a major uh, stabilizing factor in the Gulf, in the Arab Gulf region. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, uh, what about Kurdistan? Would this revolution uh, reach Kurdistan region, or they are stable? What's their future? Well, uh, you see, the there's corruption in, in, in corruption in, mm -hmm. in, in Kurdistan, especially the two major political parties, right? The Democratic Party Kurdistan and the and the, Pat the Patriotic mm -hmm. Union. Uh, you know, they are co controlled, these parties, by the families of the mm -hmm. respective leaders and so on. And there's corruption there. But yet, despite the corruption, there's some sort of um, redistribution of the wealth of the region to the people. So their living standards and so on better than the middle and the south and the west of Iraq. And second, many people in Kurdistan look at these protests as purely Shiite internal conflict because most of the provinces and the cities in Iraq, in the middle and the south, that mm -hmm. protested against the, these political parties are from this sh nominally Shiite population. Mm -hmm. So they think, uh-huh, you know, th this is an internal Shiite conflict. 
And the third thing is, I think it is in the interest of the mainstream political parties in Kurdistan to sustain this muhasasa, the ethno-sectarian power sharing formula, because they benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So they fear if the revolution becomes successful and this system, the, the muhasasa system, is transformed into a much more democratic system, they might lose some sort of influence and, of course, um, uh, of the wealth mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they acquired in the last few years um, in Iraq. But I think, knowing that the Kurds are pragmatic, if they see, until now, they insist on you know, sustaining the status quo with some cosmetic changes. But once they realize that the October Revolution is successful mm -hmm. and there are real reform in place, I think they will you know, adjust to it and renegotiate their status and so on with, with the central government. Okay, do you see a major geopolitical changes in the region soon? Well, yes, I mean, as I said, if, if the October Revolution is successful mm -hmm. and a government that represents the people and insist on the independence and sovereignty of Iraq mm -hmm. and push back against the influence on Iran, this mm -hmm. will have an impact on the whole region, not only on this corridor, Iran, mm -hmm. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, in a sectarian sense. Mm -hmm. This will have a positive effect by all means, because people in Lebanon and Syria, and even in Iran, they will mm -hmm. demand their rights too, democratic rights. But also on the Gulf region, because you know, a strong, independent, national Iraq, not sectarian mm -hmm. Iraq, yeah. is in the interest in the, of the Gulf Arab states. And I think this will help them too so solve their own crisis because they have a crisis since 2017. Mm -hmm. There's a conflict between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. I think regaining Iraq back to the Arabic environment will help also the Arab Gulf state to overcome their problems, and you know the whole region would be much more stable. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so I believe there will be, you know, a geopolitical. And there's one more thing. If the October Revolution in Iraq is successful, I guarantee you, mm -hmm. people in Iran will massively go on the street and demand radical reform too. And at this point, mm -hmm. where the regime in Iran facing enormous economic crisis, crisis of legitimacy, and then facing the street demanding radical reform, so they, will, they will have two options. Either introduce reforms and and this way they lose grip or control of, of the population in Iran, or sustain violence and oppression, and that would mean you know, the destruction of the regime. So if they are wise, they will introduce reform, not only within Iran, but to pull back their you know, influence or militias in the region and use these resources within Iran to reform the country. Mm -hmm. If they are wise, they would do this. If they insist because they are ideologically driven in a sectarian way, that would be the end of the regime. And how could this revolution be a success? Well, I have, I said, you know, five things mm -hmm. uh, need to be done. The first thing I think, since you cannot rely on the parliament in Iraq, most of the mm -hmm. parties are corrupt and the government resigned. So the, the protesters in Iraq, they should nominate the, um, the minister president and his cabinet mm -hmm. from within the Tahrir squares. And they should put a, a, a deadline for this transitional government, six months and so on, until there's a new election. Third, they should draft a new election law, more you know, um, uh, proportional and representative com uh, compared to the old um, election law that mm -hmm. favored these corrupt uh, pa mm -hmm. parties. Fourth, they need to um, come up with a draft for a party law, because the existing party laws is so, you know, uh, obscure that people even don't know how these parties are funded, where does the money come from, and that is one of the reasons of the corruption in, in the country. So you need a party law, a new party law. And I think if they manage this and bring this transitional government and have a new election, supervised by the United Nations for the sake of transparency and so on, 
and you have a parliament that represents the people, I think this parliament then could also you know, reform the constitution. There are a lot of gaps and holes in this constitution. We can reform the constitution. But any transitional government, to be successful, to gain legitimacy from the people, and feel obliged to introduce this radical reform, it needs to do two things at the beginning. First, bring those who are responsible for the killing of the young Iraqi people to court, and second, open the um, corruption files. There are a lot of files against a lot of politicians in Iraq, and everybody knows about them. You need to take a decisive action against those corrupt people who plundered the wealth of the nation. Mm -hmm. If this government doesn't do these two things, I can guarantee you the revolution will go on. But if it does take these two things seriously, I think people will give her the benefit of the doubt and will go ahead with this whatever uh, agenda for the transitional period. Okay, if the <coughs> uh, revolution Sorry. succeeded yes. and there are some changes in the region, uh, what is the future of the occupation forces in the region? And well, you see, we had, you know, a few weeks ago there was a, um, I would call it a, um, a theater in the mm. parliament. You have some Shiite political parties uh, celebrating, you know, um, a decision to to uh, kick out the the U.S. Uh, forces from Iraq. Mm -hmm. To me, as I said, it, it's a theater because it has just a symbolic character, which is a message to Iran: "We are with you." Mm -hmm. But you know, most of the political forces in Iraq, the Kurds, the so-called Sunni, and some of the Shia, did not participate anyway. So, and this and this decision. You know, uh, it was illegal and unconstitutional because such, dem you know, uh, such a demand should come from the Iraqi government. But the Iraqi government resigned, so there is no government now. Uh, and the second thing is, Iraq has, you can say, three three different agreements: two with the United States and one with the International Coalition. The the one with the International Coalition, since 2014, was due to the you know, occupation of ISIS of Iraq. Mm -hmm. So Iraq, the Iraqi government at that time ask the international community to support Iraq against ISIS. That's a different t type of agreement. There are two agreements in 2008 between Iraq and the U.S. One of them was about the withdrawal of the U.S. troops in 2011 and the establishment of um, U.S. military bases in Iraq. And the other one, the, the strategic um, agreement, was about you know, security, military, economic, cultural, and so on, agreement between them. And one of the, you know, one of the paragraphs of these agreements um, says that any, you know, um, government, be it the Iraqi or the U.S. government, wants to end this agreement, it should notify the other part, the other party, one year ahead. Mm -hmm. So again, this uh, this um, puppet theater in Parliament last few weeks celebrating yeah. we will kick out the, the U.S. military troops is nonsensical, because even those who are extremely pro Iran the Shiite parties and their militias, they know that if the U.S. troops withdraw from Iraq, they will be the first to lose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they use the U.S. all the time, you know, yeah. as a chip against Iran mm -hmm. to, you know, get more support, more funding from Iran and so on by saying, you know, we are your connection to the U.S. So if they kick the U.S. from Iraq, they will lose their bargain chip. So even they themselves Really, like, in, in, you know, as I said, we should differentiate between political performance uh, and real politics, we call it in German, real politics. Mm -hmm. The political performance is, you know, just like propaganda, telling the people, yeah, we will kick the U.S. troops out and we are, mm. you know, long live the resistance and blah, blah, blah. But in a real term, I assure you, when they sit with the American side, they tell them, you know what, stay here. Mm -hmm. True. Okay, what's the best scenario to achieve stability in the region? I think mm -hmm. the best and the most optimistic scenario is for the October Revolution in Iraq to succeed. Mm -hmm. I must say, uh, 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 let me put it in a uh, different way. The October Revolution in Iraq already succeeded. That's why you cannot win against it. Mm -hmm. And it succeeded on so many different levels. It created a civil society within Iraq. It 
try to overcome the sectarian, ethno-religious, uh, racist, uh, you know, structure that was um, institutionalized after 2003. It creates a sense of solidarity among the people. Mm -hmm. It creates a sense of a citizenship rather than a sectarian identity. It creates the, the, the need for a, a, a state of law and so on. All this will have, on the middle and the long run, a huge positive effect on Iraq, on the region. So regardless of what will happen in the next few days and weeks, I am saying it. The revolution already succeeded. What is left is the last part is to institutionalize the revolution. And that's why when I suggested about the election and, and parties and so on, is to institutionalize these demands and these needs and these you know, practices. I, I call it like a, you know, a, a civilized way of practicing politics in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pure democratic sense. If that could be institutionalized, so yeah, I am very optimistic. Uh, do you see that coming soon? Soon depends on like this temporal moment is, is very tricky mm -hmm. because soon could be you know a few weeks, a month, or a year or two, mm -hmm. right? But yes, if we look at this time frame, a year or two from now, I would say yes. Okay. Is there anything else we, uh, you'd like to add? No, thanks for having me. Adel. Okay, thank you very much for Pleasure. being with us today. Pleasure. And hope to see you again. Thank you. Up until next time, have a good night.